Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. As you can see from the image on the right, we've taken a screenshot of the attendee interface control panel. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. The first thing I want to draw your attention to are the audio options. If you have joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system and would prefer to join over the telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Next, should you require technical assistance, please type your question into the questions panel to the right of your screen and we will assist you. You will also use the same question panel to ask your questions during the session. As a participant, your audio is going to be on mute. However, you will have the opportunity to submit questions at any time. We will be collecting all the questions and we'll address them during the end of the presentation as time permits. In addition, there will be handouts for today's session in the form of the presentation slides. You can download the handout document directly from your control panel at the end of the presentation. Your certificate of attendance will be forwarded to you by email within one week following the presentation. Lastly, I'd like to note that today's session is being recorded. I'd like to hand it over to Michelle Boston. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Success with Real Food Containing Two Feedings in Pediatrics, a Dietitian's Perspective. My name is Michelle Boston. And I'm a medical affairs manager with Nestle Health Science, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Now, it's with pleasure that I introduce our presenter, Ali Browse. Ali has been working as a pediatric dietitian for the past nine years in both community and acute care settings. Currently, Ali works in ambulatory care at BC Children's Hospital and provides nutrition care for infants and children with feeding difficulties and or who require home enteral nutrition. In this capacity, she frequently supports families who wish to pursue real food containing two feeding formulas. As a member of an interdisciplinary feeding team, Ali has had the opportunity to learn from her physician, dietitian, occupational therapy, nursing, and social work colleagues. In addition, Alice, Ali recently finished her Master's of Health Administration, congratulations, Ali, and is passionate about high-quality, patient-centered healthcare. Today, this webinar will assist dietitians and other healthcare professionals to better understand what's involved with homemade tube feedings and how to support patients and their caregivers to safely and effectively use real food options. So I'll now turn the floor over to you, Ali. Great, thank you, Michelle and Sam. So this presentation is actually, it's fairly short. It should be about 25 minutes, and then there'll be, there should be a good amount of time for questions at the end. I'll just start by reviewing the objectives. So by the end of the webinar, I really hope that you have a better understanding of the pros and cons of using real food for tube feeding and the evidence behind them. I hope that you can appreciate how to successfully select and match patients with the options available and that you can start to build your own toolbox to help manage children who are on home tube feeds using real food. So a bit of background on enteral feeding. Uh, historically, enteral feeding goes back to ancient Egyptian times when nutrition was infused rectally for management of different bowel disorders. Then starting around the 18th century, there are reports of people using oral and nasal gastric tubes, but the modern era of enteral feeding really didn't begin until about the 20th century. It was around this time that we also started to learn a lot more about nutrition. And instead of just using things like broth, eggs, meat, milk for tube feeding, a modified macro and micronutrient supplements were added to tube feeds for enhanced nutrition. Shortly after this, commercial formula started to be developed and provided an opportunity to deliver a sterile formula with consistent nutrient and osmolarity levels. In the 1960s, commercial formulas began to be the standard of practice in North America, and these formulas continued to develop to meet the needs of different medical conditions. And currently, there are over 100 enteral formulas on the market and include all sorts of products, including standard, elemental, and specialized formulas. Despite the vast variety and availability of enteral formulas, 
some patients and families choose to provide real food by tube as an alternative to commercial formula. So here we are at the first polling question. I'll, I'll read it out and it should pop up on your screen here. So I'm curious to know how many of your patients or clients use real food for tube feeding. Okay, great. This is this is really interesting. It's, it seems like half of people actually have no clients on on two feeds, and that might be that that a big proportion of people actually aren't seeing this population, aren't seeing home two feed patients, or um, work in you know a hospital setting and don't see outpatients. It seems like uh, also a good proportion have a very small number, zero to five. And then a couple people, like 5%, have more than 10 uh, clients on tube feeds. And I'd probably say for myself, I would have put 10 to 20. So really, uh, probably somewhere in between 10 to 20 patients on my caseload at one time are on making their own formula or part of their feeds using real food. And then we also do, in our clinic, we provide ongoing consultation to families and so a small number of these patients also are using real food too. But it seems like still this is a, a pretty small percentage of anyone's population. But it does seem to be growing. Okay, I'm going to go back to my presentation here. Okay. So although real using real food for tube feeding still isn't standard practice, the population of clients choosing this method of tube feeding does seem to be growing. This renewed interest in using real food is often, but not always, patient or parent driven rather than health provider driven. And usually because of some concerns around safety of using real food for tube feeding. Many parents are choosing real food for feeding because of a belief that food is nutritionally superior or they're just looking for ways to advocate uh, advocate for ways to align their personal values around nutrition with the ways that they feed their children. In addition, there are increased opportunities for families to network and share information using the internet, through the use of Facebook groups, blogs, and websites. And people are often getting health information and advice from other patients and families rather than just health professionals. Moving forward, I think it's really important for health professionals and families to understand some of the proposed pros and cons of using real food when tube feeding. I'll start with some of the cons or the risks. The first con of using real food, which is of course dependent on a person's perspective, is the additional time and resources required to safely prepare nutritionally appropriate feeds for tube feeding. From a parent's perspective, the amount of time required to open a ready to feed form can of formula is definitely faster than planning, cooking, and preparing homemade feeds, and sometimes can even be cheaper when formula is covered by a provincial funding program. And then from a dietitian's point of view, it does uh, take a lot more time to educate families on how to use real food for tube feeding, as well as analyzing the nutrient composition comparatively to commercial formulas. So the last slide was primarily based on clinical experience, talking to families and other dietitians. And then this slide is based on some of the available literature on homemade tube feeding. Some of the risks or cons that are, associated, that are discussed include uh, microbial contamination, which can then lead to foodborne illness, nutritionally inadequate diets, and tube occlusion. So for microbial contamination and foodborne illness, there are three studies that I reviewed and I've really found that looked at hospital-prepared homemade feeds and compared them to commercial formulas 
And all the studies found that there were significantly more contaminants in real food containing formulas comparatively to sterile commercial formulas. And interestingly, poor hand hygiene and food handling practices were identified to be the main source of contamination. And then next, there were two studies that looked at the nutrient composition of real food containing formulas. One was a case study from 2015 that reported scurvy in a child who was on homemade feeds with multiple presumed food allergies, which ultimately resulted in vitamin C deficiency. The next was a study from the Philippines in 2004, which compared expected and actual levels of micro and macronutrients in formulas and determined that in homemade feeds, there was an inconsistent and unpredictable level of nutrients compared to the expected levels, which highlighted concerns regarding nutrient adequacy. And finally, there were two studies that really looked at the physical qualities of homemade feeds and found that they had significantly higher viscosity and osmolarity compared to commercial formulas, which resulted in higher risk of tube blockage. There are also a number of proposed benefits or pros of using real food. I will first review some from patient and other health provider perspectives. And these include opportunities for enhanced nutrient variety, including nutrients that may be limited in commercial formulas, such as phytonutrients, omega-3s, and fiber. And as we know, the field of nutrition continues to evolve and commercial formulas need to be modified to meet new standards and guidelines. Providing a variety of foods is proposed as an opportunity to ensure meals are nutritionally adequate. Additionally, the parent-child feeding relationship can sometimes be enhanced by using real food as one way to include a two-fed child in mealtime rituals and respecting individual cultural norms around food. There have really only been about two published studies that I've found so far looking at the proposed benefits of real food for tube feeding. The first was a prospective cross-sectional study that looked at adults who chose to use real food for tube feeding at home. There were about 54 adults using homemade tube feeding included in the study, and overall patients reported less nausea, bloating, diarrhea, and constipation uh, using real food. Next, there was a prospective cohort study that followed 33 children who were experiencing gagging and retching after a fund application surgery and chose to try a homemade tube feed that reduced their symptoms. To reduce their symptoms, the study concluded that real food formulas could decrease gagging and retching in children post fund application and that they could actually potentially help to support a transition to oral diets. So although the evidence behind the pros and cons of using real, tube, real food for tube feeding is fairly limited, and doing a randomized control trial to assess clinical outcomes of food versus formula is very difficult, I wanted to circle back to why real food should be considered as an option to safely provide nutrition for tube feeding from my perspective. And then I've also included a reference to the 2015 American Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics member survey on dietitians' perspectives with real food for tube feeding. So firstly, if we want to practice patient-centered care, we, we do need to be respectful and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values, and ensure that patient values guide decision-making. And of course, we need to make sure that we we as healthcare providers are ensuring best practice and safe, effective care that is evidence-informed, but we need to do this in a way that's meaningful and valuable to our clients. It's really difficult to engage in a discussion about using real food for tube feeding if we kind of immediately shut patients down when they ask about it. Um, and if dietitians aren't going to be the ones to support families to, to do this, then there are lots of other health professionals and and patients out there that are educating families on the topic. And then I put the study up here for reference and maybe just to, again, validate some of my own thoughts and perspectives on using real foods. It was just a survey done on the attitudes and experiences of dietitians in the pediatric practice group with the American Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And while only 
58% of the respondents had experience using real food in practice, 80% reported positive outcomes, and 30% wanted more information on how to use it in practice. So I think it's, it's still really a growing area where all of us are just looking for ways to um, kind of have best practice guidelines and uh, care for our patients when we've got really busy caseloads. Here we are at polling question number two. The question is, what do you feel is the main driver for your patients or clients using real food for tube feeding? And I know a lot of people don't have patients that are on tube feeds. You can answer this if you'd like or from your kind of perspective or thoughts as well. Okay, interesting. So it looks like most people who answered uh, the main reason why they're they're choosing uh, blenderized tube feeds is basically the family's preference and the family's probably coming to them asking about it. Uh, and then it looks like there's a small percentage that have kind of poor tolerance or that the cost of formula is high and that they can prepare real food on their own for a cheaper. And I'd, I'd definitely say this also aligns with my own practice. Most patients that I see on home tube feeds, homemade feeds using real food, are families that really have come asking for it. Although I, I will say in our clinic, we've had more and more success with it and, uh, and more health professionals are also recommending it. One of our gastroenterologists often does suggest it to families as another option. And so that's leading to more families being curious and learning and just wanting to give it a try. So I'll go back to my presentation here. So moving forward, I wanted to discuss a case example of someone from our clinic and then use this example to talk about deciding what types of patients are suitable candidates for homemade tube feeds and how we can best support them to make safe and nutritionally balanced feeds. In other presentations I've done, I've often started to talking about kind of the first patient I ever worked with who wanted to provide real food and kind of my <laughs> little bit of my shock and my learning around the process. So this time I wanted to just review a different patient uh, who I would describe as a classic example of a child who uh, really wanted to, really benefited from homemade tube feeds and the family was quite motivated. So this little girl was actually a twin. She was born late preterm, around 35 weeks, and had a congenital diaphragmatic hernia, which required surgery, and then pretty significant reflux, which in combination to her extended NICU admission resulted in an oral aversion, and ultimately the need for J-tube feeds. When she was about three, she was able to switch back to G-feeds, but continued to be dependent on her tube feeds for nutrition. She did work with an occupational therapist on feeding, but really was only taking taste, really didn't swallow anything. And despite her history, she was developmentally very similar to her twin sister, except for her delayed oral motor development. I had followed this patient since she was about two years of age and around four years of age, the family really started to ask and inquire about if they could give her some real food via tube. So after having more families eagerly requesting to start real food for tube feedings, it became clear that we, which is myself and other dietitians I work with, as well as physicians, nurses, social workers, etc., needed to learn more uh, and needed to have some idea of the best candidates for homemade tube feeds. I will say that despite having these criteria, we still do have patients that don't meet this criteria who still choose to use real food in their tubes. However, we do our best to educate and document along the way. So the first is that patients should be considered medically stable. <laughs> 
because of the improved control of fluid and nutrient administration and decreased risk of contamination, especially for immunocompromised patients. So the patients who use, typically don't meet this criteria are hospitalized patients. However, we do have a policy for using real food in hospital when it's clinically appropriate. The next is the patient should be greater than six months to align with Health Canada's guidelines on infant feeding. And we do, however, have children who are on breast milk or formula after six months of age who may consider complementary food introduction by gastrostomy tube to allow exposure to new foods. And then uh, their medical needs need to be met using food. So children on specialized enteral formulas for metabolic or gastrointestinal conditions may not be suitable candidates for real food. And next we have children, uh, we have said children should be gastrostomy fed to be candidates for using real food in their tube. I often explain this to families as one, gastrostomy tubes are the largest diameter compared to NG or J tubes to decrease the risk of tube blockages. And the G tube really should be kind of at least 14 French in diameter. And then the stomach can better tolerate hypertonic feeds in comparison to the small bowel. So then there's less risk of things like dumping syndrome. And the feeds can be provided as a bolus, which would minimize the risk of foodborne illness because food really shouldn't be left at room temperature for greater than two hours, which would make things like continuous feeds logistically challenging. And then finally, we do want to set families up for success. So encourage them to make sure that they have the equipment and knowledge required to prepare their own feeds. So this leads us to our third polling question. Um, what is your primary concern about patients using real food for tube feeding? Okay, so um, yeah, interesting here. It looks like half the group is mostly concerned about nutrient deficiencies, and then another uh, kind of 20% about food safety and the tube blockage, and kind of equally with the additional time required for uh, dietitians to teach and analyze feeds. Um, and I would say, again, for myself, at first, I was mostly concerned about the safety of it all and if it, you know, would cause foodborne illness or two would be blocked or um, there'd be kind of nutritionally inadequate diets. And, and I did find, though, that often that was because families would be doing it um, before they really got any teaching on the topic and they were doing it on their own. And sometimes it, was, it would be families that were had a lot of um, food intolerances or sensitivities, and they were already on diets that would be nutritionally at risk. Um, and now that I've had a lot more clients use real food by tube, I would definitely say the biggest barrier for myself working with families is just it still does take additional time and using commercial formula is, is simpler from my perspective when I'm analyzing and monitoring them. Um, but I have had, I've had, I haven't had uh, very many concerns or problems with food safety or even nutritionally inadequate diets after I've done more teaching and work closer with families that are choosing this method of feeding. So I'll go back to the presentation here. So at Children's, we've made some basic handouts to help with, uh, so this BC Children's, we've made some handouts to help with teaching families about using real food. And the first is on equipment and supplies and has similar information to what's on the screen here. So 
really having the right equipment to prepare, store, and administer uh, homemade formula helps to ensure that food is blenderized or blended to a consistency that can easily pass through a feeding tube and then can also minimize the risk of foodborne illness. So the most common blenders that families use are the Vitamix and the Blendtec. And occasionally families may use a regular blender, but uh, food really does need to be soft enough to be liquidized and then often might need to even be strained through using the tube. So there's additional processes and then you may lose some fiber, et cetera, doing that. And then families also need cooking and storage space, which seems obvious, but it's still really important to discuss. And finally, families need to have syringes, and if they're using a low profile tube, they need a bolus extension set as well. And then we often just use the regular uh, syringes here, often the 60 or the 30 mils um, that are supplied through our medical supply program here. But I do know that that a number of families will choose to buy these silicone O-ring syringes online because they find that they last longer and they're easier to clean. Uh, however, unfortunately in BC, we don't really have a local supplier, so families are seem to be purchasing these from the states. Uh, before designing an individualized nutrition plan for patients, it is really important to kind of discuss what the ultimate goal is. So choosing a homemade or a commercial formula doesn't need to be mutually exclusive. A combination can definitely be appropriate as well. Some families may just want to introduce some complementary foods by G-Tube, while others may want to move towards a whole foods diet completely. And for families who really want to move to exclusively using real food by tube, I find it still really important to discuss a backup plan using formula for things like disaster planning, if there's a power outage or an earthquake, or even a hospital admission. And I know that many families and dietitians like to have a formula recipe. And although I have done this lots in the past, and you can find different example recipes if you look through the references at the end, and the references and the resources at the end, I've actually moved away from this method when working with families now, and I've moved more towards using a recipe template to allow for more increased variety in the diet. So this is an example of a template we use when teaching families about how to plan for a nutritionally balanced formula. It really is based on Canada's food guide, but can be modified to based on a person's nutrient needs and nu nutrition preferences. What I often do is educate families on preparing balanced meals and feeds, and then get them to send me a couple examples of their blends to review, and then we can make modifications to ensure calories, protein, fluid, micronutrient needs, et cetera, are being met. A couple important things to consider are kind of how much of the total blend your patient is getting in a day or in a feed too. So um, again, it's very different practice than just knowing often the amount of meals that a patient gets at a feed. You wanna know what percentage of their total blend they're able to get in a day. And so that can help me better assess their caloric and nutrient intake. And then I also always look at the macronutrient division, kind of just based on the types of foods that they're providing. I've found that, especially children that have a very difficult time tolerating volume, that parents are very inclined to give really high fat foods. So, you know, like, cream instead of whole milk or um, extra oils just so that they can really boost the calories up and then this can sometimes in itself lead to tolerance issues and it's hard to know kind of what came first but having really high high fat feeds sometimes makes tolerance a little bit more challenging and then because food has been liquidized sometimes families really forget to add free water as they count all the feeds as fluid intake so you really need to focus on getting enough free water in and then in many cases also if they're using a lot of whole foods added salt is needed um, to make sure they're getting enough sodium as well so going back to the case example i discussed we did a gradual transition from commercial to 
uh, from commercial formula to whole foods just by offering some meals of whole foods during the day and formula at night and then trans transitioning to exclusively whole foods during the day. A couple points to note include the fact that uh, she had been tube fed since she was about four years of age and and so she really hadn't been exposed to too many other foods so we did a, a pretty gradual introduction of new foods into her diet over about one to two months before making complete blends and she tolerated all the foods well and so parents were able to really just use foods that they had available for the rest of the family and then i just have a example here of what her daily uh, blend template looks like and the food, uh, the servings are based on kind of the food guide servings. And then we also have a handout for families on the preparation of feeds, which basically just reviews safe food handling practice guidelines, including washing all fruits and vegetables, cooking meats, fish, eggs, and poultry to appropriate temperatures. And then again, making sure food is blended appropriately and um, thin enough to pass through a tube using a syringe and again cooled within two hours. And then families are also educated on how to store formula in the refrigerator or the freezer, making sure that they label it appropriately. Um, and they're also just, uh, just the topic of administering feeds is discussed and definitely encouraged to use a syringe rather than a feeding pump. Right? We do have a couple of families that use a feeding pump and this typically isn't recommended practice because there's risk of it, again, um, uh, clogging in, in the pump as well. And then reviewing that food just can't be left out for more than two hours. And then finally, just to review, so this little girl who's on home feeds, she's, this is three years later, she's been growing well, she's meeting her nutrient needs. This is a, a pretty easy case because they have a, a, a twin, so they also can review again what she's eating and have some um, nutritionally balanced meals. This way, she, this little girl's eating almost 70% of her nutrition orally now, which again, her goal is ultimately all oral feeds. She, doesn't have any dysphagia or um, any safety concerns around her swallow. She just has delayed skills. And I, I wouldn't say that being on homemade feeds is the reason why she's been eating more. Uh, we also have a tube wean program at our hospital, so she's gone through that as well. But I think it's definitely helped parents understand some of her nutrition needs and goals, and then just given her more opportunity to be exposed to different foods. So now she uh, kind of gets this breakfast blend of extra uh, breakfast type foods after she eats breakfast, and then this kind of savory blend of some other nutrients she needs after she finishes eating lunch and dinner, mostly because, because her skills are still kind of delayed. It takes a long time for her to eat, and we want her to have time to do things that other seven-year-olds should be doing besides just spending all day eating as well. And then the family also is uses formula when they travel or when someone's babysitting or just needs something on the go too. So they've definitely been very receptive to using both forms of nutrition whenever um, when needed. And then finally, I just, I have these two books on the top I find are really helpful both for families and health professionals if you just want to kind of feel a little bit more confident, confident about the topic. And two websites here at the bottom, but I definitely have other websites I can share with you if you're interested. You can just send me an email as well. <clears throat> and there's some references at the end that you can look at, but I will open it up to questions now, and I'm going to let Michelle moderate here. Great. Thank you very much, Ali. As you noted, we're now going to begin answering the questions that have been submitted during today's presentation, and we'll answer as many as we can in the time we have left. So as a reminder to everyone participating, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. As well, you can download the handouts if you haven't already by using the control panel to the right of your screen. So we have two questions, um, Ali, that are fairly related. Um, so the first one is, how do you manage patients admitted to hospital who insist on using their real food 
related feeds during the admission and the second question was about what, asking about access to your policy within the hospital so perhaps if you talk about your own experience that would help here sure so uh, so we recently developed it and definitely if you send me an email I can share it with you after our hospital just asked that you kind of acknowledge our hospital for um, developing the resource too but we basically have a um, Oh, a consent form for families that they are kind of a waiver that says they acknowledge that there are some risks um, doing it and they're consenting right now we have said that we don't have the capacity to make homemade feeds so we rely on the families for bringing them in and we have a couple of guidelines in there that say that we'd like them to list all the ingredients so we know what's going into it, we know the recipe for each feed and then that they acknowledge that they'll work with a dietitian and then that they need the MRP or the physician looking after them to sign off on it. So, um, you know, occasionally there, we definitely still have some challenges or some conflicts, but having the policy available has made it so that we can have that discussion sooner so that families know you know if they're going into the ICU it's typically not practice and they're medically unstable and they don't qualify and we want them to have formula but if they're getting admitted for uh, elective ortho surgery and they would have been advanced to a regular diet pretty quickly after then we get them to just sign the waiver and then we also it's tricky because um, often the the nurses aren't allowed to uh, administer kind of like an unknown feed even if it has the the recipe on it so parents have to be available to provide the feed by tube as well okay great our next question is do you have any baseline or annual blood work that you do you know um, no, not not really anymore. Only, I mean, we sometimes we would do kind of nutritional blood work for any kid who we were worried about nutrient deficiencies or um, kind of their nutrition status. Um, so, but we don't do it just for baseline um, anyone who's on a homemade feed, just because we found that kind of similar to the way that lots of kids are eating, unless we are really concerned about. Uh, what the family is using and then their risk of deficiencies. We haven't found that regular monitoring um, outside of like or kind of different than any other patients been necessary right now. Okay, fair enough. Um, another question here, what grain products do you recommend that blend well, specifically whole grains? Um, well, the first thing I will say. What doesn't <laughs> blend well? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, one is I have had people say, does it need to be cooked, um, which seems silly. And again, um, of course, like food that you would cook when you're eating orally should be cooked going into it. So um, just as a reminder to families who think they could put raw, you know, uncooked rice in, that would not be appropriate. So they're reminded to cook food the same way that they would cook it for anyone else in the family. and then. You know, I, I found that, again, like most whole grains have worked. So like, I mean, breads or cereals. And then also I've used even like, like a whole grain rice or couscous or quinoa too. It's just that some of them thicken up over the course of the day. So they need a little bit more fluid added to it. Okay, fair enough. Um, to have time for a couple more here, um, have you had experience with real food tube feeding versus commercial real food supplements such as Complete with respect to the extent of GERD and retching? Um, you know, I, I, I don't think I've still had that much experience of like a huge difference except, I mean, I guess I have seen a couple of families that have that do have less gagging and and vomiting with feeds too, right? I can't say that it's even specific to like a particular formula per se too, right? And so I don't really know if it's just the um, 
that kids get kind of that taste or smell fatigue of having the same formula over and over and just get, you know, or if it helps with gastric emptying, I haven't, I don't know if I can answer that question as a, like, again, that's where I'm a little bit stuck with, I still, we haven't always kind of recommended it as to improve clinical outcomes. We think you should go to real food. It's more as a, another option for patients who just feel that they want to, to offer food to their kids. I don't know if that answers it completely. Fair enough. Um, I know it's hard when you're an N of one. Um, what is your email address? That would be an important thing to share with people if they wanted to reach out to you for your policy at the hospital. Okay. Is that something? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, um, I'll, I'll give you, because I'm not on my work computer right now, I can, I'll share my Ali Boyle. So I still use my old last name. So it's A-L-I-B-O-Y-L-E dot nutrition at gmail.com. Okay, great. And I know we've had several more questions um, and we'll do our best to get some responses from Ali to share back out. Um, but that is the end of our time today. So I'd like to thank all of you, including Ali, for attending today's webinar, Success with Real Food Containing Two Feedings in Pediatrics, A Dietitian's Perspective. One last reminder to all of you to download the handouts using the control panel to the right of the screen. After this webinar, you will receive a short survey and we'd appreciate your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within the next week with a link to view a recording of today's webinar and to receive your certificate of attendance. On behalf of Nestle Health Science and our presenter, thank you so much for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.